All right, today we're going to talk about switching regulators. Yay! Cheers from the crowd. Switching regulators. What's the deal with switching regulators? Why do we use them? How do they work? Well, let's sort of compare them to the linear regulators that we looked at. So a linear regulator has a bunch of uh, good, good things to say about it, maybe some not so good things to say about it. On the good side, it's simple. It's a fairly simple layout, you know, using a little op amp, feedback loop, pass transistor, okay. Um, low electro electrical noise, it has fast response. So in other words, if the load demand changes, it can respond to it very quickly. Okay, so there isn't a lag time. The downside is ugh, low efficiency, especially if you're looking at a low output voltage. Because remember, the voltage across the pass transistor, that is what's taking up the difference between the unregulated power supply output and the regulated output. Transistors operating in the linear region, that means it always has load current flowing through it and a decent size voltage. You know, not a huge voltage, but there is some voltage there. So that product gives us the power that's power dissipated in the pass transistor. Okay, that's, you know, not so good. Power wasted, it's heat. Now, in comparison, switching regulator Very high efficiency. Right? We can get over 95% with these things. But you're going to pay for it. Okay? These things are a little bit more complex in terms of their design. They are electrically noisy, or at least potentially they're electrically noisy. Right? But there are some other good things. Um, it turns out that the filter values that you need, the, uh, the like LC values, are fairly modest size small sizes, okay? Um, it can also be set up different ways. You can set this thing up as a, a standard step down, like we saw with the linear. It can be set to do a step up, so the voltage out is bigger than what came in, and it can also be set up as an inverting, so you could have a positive voltage coming in and get a negative voltage coming out. That's pretty cool all right so it's a bit more flexible it's higher efficiency and um, unfortunately it's you know, a little bit more complex and it's uh, you know electrically a little bit noisier the response isn't necessarily as fast it can be let's just say sufficient but since it's in its very nature sort of a pulse kind of operation um, it's not necessarily like right on top of it the way a, a linear regulator is. So how does it work? Right? Well, let's just say we have a load. I'm just going to throw some sort of easy numbers out here. All right? So I've got like a, a, an equivalent 10 ohm load. And I want to get 5 volts across this thing. Right? So I just want to make a 5 volt regulator. That's my goal. Well, obviously through Ohm's law, we could say that the load current on here, 5 volts over... Uh, 10 ohms is going to give us half an amp. Okay. Now here's what we're going to do is we're, we're going to pulse the uh, current coming into the load. So mathematically, we're going to average this out to get half an amp. There's going to be a problem with this as, as we'll see, but this is what we're looking at. All right, so here's time. So imagine I have a situation where there's a 10 volt unregulated source and I'm going to switch this thing on and off, 50% on, 50% off. So my waveform is going to look kind of like this, right? I'm going to get this pulse that's going to go up to 10 volts. That's going to go down to zero. It's going to pulse back up to 10 volts, come back down to zero. So 50-50 for on and off, okay? So basically I have 10 volts across here, then nothing, then 10 volts across, then nothing, so on and so forth. 
Well, 10 volts across 10 ohm gives us 1 amp. All right? But it only occurs half the time. So in fact, the average of this is going to work out to half an amp. The average voltage is 5 volts, what we want. Of course, that's not really the same as having a constant 5 volt DC value, right? You can't hopefully, you know, cross your fingers and try to drive some TTL logic circuits with this kind of power supply. It's not going to work. Even if on paper you can say, well, it averages out to be 5 volts, right? We have to do something. Well, basically what we wind up doing is filtering this so that the energy here winds up here. Okay? Now this might seem sort of um, unnecessarily complicated. Like, why, why do this? I mean, I'm going to have to come up with some kind of LC network to do this filtering. Um, and the idea of modest component sizes comes about if I switch this very, very fast. You know, if I switch this at, let's say, like, a, you know, 100 kilohertz, just to throw a number out there. Well, how big do the L and C values have to be if you're switching on and off at 100 kilohertz versus, you know, 120 hertz for a full wave rectified, um, you know, AC source in, in North America? Okay, well, obviously, higher frequency, smaller values. But, like, why do this to begin with? Well, it all has to do with the power dissipation on the pass transistor. So remember what we're talking about over here, right? You've got a pass transistor. Here's, I'm not going to draw the whole op amp, but here's a control circuit. And, you know, this goes out to your load. So this thing is passing the current. And there's always a voltage across it that's taking the difference between the unregulated and the regulated output, right? So... There's always a decent power dis uh, dissipation in there. With this, we're only going to turn the transistor on fully, saturation, and then off fully, so it's in cutoff. But when you look at those waveforms, something really interesting happens. So if we were to say, I'll use blue here for my uh, current through the uh, transistor. So we get a pulse. So this is my on pulse, 10 volts, 10 ohms, 1 amp. And then that thing turns off. Now, the edges on these things are not perfectly straight up and down. I mean, there is some rise and fall time. Okay, let's not forget that. Now, the voltage across the transistor, the VCE, is going to flip this, right? So... If this is saturation and this is cutoff, all right, so this is saturation, over here's cutoff. Well, the saturation voltage is really small. You know, it's maybe a few tenths of a volt. So we get something, now there was a transition over here. So we get something like down here. And then when it goes to cutoff, this thing pops back up and goes up, you know, in our case, to let's say 10 volts. And the same thing happens and it just repeats. Well, power is the product of these two things. So in cutoff, it's power of the transistor. So in cutoff, big voltage, zero current. So we have, you know, zero power. During the saturation, we have a big current, but the voltage is really small. Right? Like I said, it may only a few tenths. So we get a small, pretty modest value out here. The only place we really get power dissipation uh, is during the transition, because you could have a, you know, modest value, a medium value of current and voltage at the same time. So you would kind of get a spike right there. All right, and then this would just continue along. So the area under the curve, right, this, represents, once you average this over a full cycle, right, from here to here, that represents the power dissipation in the pass transistor. That's wasted power. So what we're saying is, hey, by doing this, as long as we have fast edges, in other words, fast device, like maybe I'll use a power MOSFET for this, okay, because they're going to switch really fast, I can minimize those spikes, minimize the overall power, that's very little power wasted. All right, so the system efficiency goes way up. Okay, that's less heat, less power being drawn, you know, it's a win-win across the board. Right. Okay. So 
that looks great on paper, literally. Um, how do we actually control this? Well, the key is to use pulse width modulation. PWM. 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 We will vary the width of the on pulse in accordance with the current draw. If the current draw is very light, in other words, effectively, if this resistor were to be a larger value, we can use a much thinner pulse. All right, average that over the full cycle. We have a lower current draw because there's a higher resistor we can maintain, in our case, the 5 volts. On the other hand, if there's a bigger current draw, in other words, effectively, if this resistance were to drop, we fatten up these pulses, you know, so we get something that, you know, maybe looks more like this. And now, greater area under the curve, higher average current, we can still maintain the 5 volts, right? So we modulate the width of the pulse in accordance with the current demand from the load, right? Hence the term pulse width modulation. Well, guess what? A pulse width modulator, the circuit to do that, is a little bit more complicated than a simple op amp. We don't have to, to sort of dive into the, the pieces of that because companies make uh, switching switch mode uh, regulator chips. That's all done for you. So I'm just going to show you sort of the outline, the basic outline, uh, in this case, of a step down. The text also shows the step up and the inverter types. But basically, just to explain how this works, because they all work along the same line. It's really just a matter of where various components are placed. But they all have the same basic components. I'm just going to draw a regular bipolar transistor here for our, for our um, pass transistor. And then I'm just going to put a little box over here to represent the pulse width modulation controller. So out here is my unregulated voltage. Okay, and then what we'll have first is a Schottky diode. So um, if you're not familiar with the Schottky diode, it's like a regular rectifying diode, except it's really fast, right? And the forward voltage on it tends to be smaller, but it's very fast and that's key, it's a very fast diode. Okay, so here, we have an inductor. Then a capacitor. That's basically the regulator. And now here we have our load. Right. So a resistor is just standing in for our load here. Right. There's our cap, there's our inductor, there's our Schottky diode, there's our device. Okay? All right. So let's take a look at what happens in the on state. So I've turned the transistor on, right? This transistor is on. It's conducting current. What ends up happening? Well, this Schottky diode is reverse biased. So it's basically an open, right? Current comes in, feeds the inductor. And there's a voltage drop developed across here, right? So energy is being stored in the, uh, in the coil, right? In the magnetic field. So as L is being charged, this current winds up coming into this little parallel combo. So that and the capacitor are basically feeding current into the load to develop uh, the output potential, right? The desired thing. I'm not drawing it here, but obviously there's got to be a sense signal from here back into the pulse width modulation controller because it has to adjust the duty cycle on that square wave. All right. Okay. So fine and dandy. Now I'm going to redraw this for the off state. So all the same components. Always looks to me like the diode's waving to you. How are you doing? Okay, so now we're in the uh, in the off state. Let's change colors over here. Okay, so what what ends up happening now? So 
Remember that a, a uh, for an inductor, the current cannot change instantaneously. So that current was flowing like so. Well, now it's still flowing like so. What winds up happening here? Well, just like we saw in RL circuits, this now turns into a source, right? The voltage can't change, or uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the current can't change instantaneously, but the voltage can. So what ends up happening is this flips pull this flips polarity, come on, pen. This flips polarity creates a source. This diode is now forward biased. All right, so current is going to flow like this, because this is off. So, you know, where is this, this current coming from? Well, it's going to come up through the diode. This point here is virtually ground, right? It's just a couple of tenths off of ground. This is ground, right? We just have this little diode drop a few tenths of a volt. So this thing is pretty close to ground. And we see this potential across the inductor. So that current feeds uh, our load. Okay, this charges up the cap, feeds the load. And basically what we're doing is, you know, like I said initially, we're filling this pulse energy over into the valley. All right, the mountaintop goes into the valley. And then the process repeats. So as this starts to droop down, as this voltage droops down, the signal is fed back to the controller, turns the transistor back on, current floods back in. You know, we build up the charge on the uh, sort of fill the reservoir, if you will, on the inductor. Um, and then, you know, that will start to rise a little bit, turns off the uh, controller. So we go from the red to the blue to the red to the blue to the red to the blue, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay? And like I said, this is going to be done very quickly. Um, faster transistor is better. It's more efficient. So we'll have, you know, 100, 200 kilohertz, whatever the heck it is. Um, we don't have to have, you know, a huge cap. We don't have to have a huge inductor. Now, some manufacturers have produced uh, almost all-in-one circuits. In other words, you can... You can uh, find controllers where really they're almost as easy to use as the as the three pin linear regulators. You know, not quite, but pretty close. Um, you might have to add, uh, you know, an external timing cap, uh, you know, maybe a small inductor or something like that, but pretty darn close. And then we have more complicated circuits where you can configure them into step up, step down, inverting by adding different components. But a lot of the work has been um, taken out of this. I mean, uh, you know, 30 years ago, this it was a pain to sort of build up one of these things. Now, you know, a lot of the drudge work has been done for you. So not quite as easy to use as um, linear regulators, but much easier than they used to be. And like I said, you can get these huge efficiencies, you know, in excess of 95%. So... Uh, where that's really important, for example, if you have something that's battery powered or where heat is a real issue or where the source for the power is very limited, um, you know, like maybe you have like a solar kind of thing, uh, that's that's your sole power source. Um, it's, a, it's a perfect sort of thing that you would find. So, you know, in like a laptop computer, for example, you wouldn't have a linear, necessarily have a linear regulator in there. You would have a switching regulator. All right.